Uh, my name is Frank Hookstra. I uh, have lived in Plainfield Township most of my life. I moved to the big town of Ada for 18 years because my work was out of Ada and moved back to the farm because I always had cattle. I've had cattle, sheep, and pork production ever since I can remember. Uh, I was born in 1936, and when I was about seven, eight years old, my job in the barn was take care of the lambs and the young calves. Uh, teach calves to drink out of a bucket. We didn't have the modern techniques they have today, but uh, it was a trip. You try to hold your fingers in their mouth, get them to drink milk. They think you're trying to drown them, and they rear back up and hit you right in the forehead with the back of their head, about knock you out. Uh, that's the start of my life that I can relate to. My grandparents came to this country from the Netherlands. My grandfather came over first class. My grandma came over what they called steerage. She had to work her way across for the passage. And I think they met on the boat. And that was where my family got started here in the United States. They moved to Michigan. And that was, they've, uh, they traveled from Chicago to Spring Lake to Tecumseh, Michigan, and back to Grand Rapids, but uh, basically Plainfield Township. What did your grandfather do then? He was a, a very specialist cabinet maker. Made a lot of, worked in Grand Rapids and all the, or in the furniture industry and Made a lot of roll top desk, and that was his specialty uh, precision cupboards in that line of work. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your father then. Your father started a dairy farm. Is that what he did also? Tell me about yeah, what he did. Uh, my, well, when they moved to Tecumseh, they had a large farm down there. The market went south, they lost the farm down there. I worked for a lady that was the, she was a professor at Michigan State, and my dad, I think, was drafted for the First World War when they lived down there in the Tecumseh area. And my grandma and grandpa, they wanted to get back with the, more of the original family. They moved back to Grand Rapids. They bought the farm here in Plainfield Township. And, of course, my dad went in the First World War. Uh, when he came home from the war, he spent some time at the Michigan Vets facility. Uh, typical battle fatigue. When he got out of there, he jumped on a train and went west. He ended up in Walla Walla, Washington. He said he wished he'd have stayed there working on a big ranch out there, but he came back to work the farm here in Plainfield Township. And, uh, yeah, basically farm life was his life. Tell me about when you, what was it like for you? So you were, you had, you were, you were in charge of the lambs and that kind of stuff. Where, where did you go to school? Did you have siblings? How many siblings did you have? And did you go to school around there? How did you get to school? What was your school life like? Had, uh, three sisters and a brother, and uh, they were all older than me. I, I was a brat of the family. Um, yeah, well, my sisters, brother, myself, all graduated from Rockford High School. So that uh, grade school was the Plainfield School, down where the senior citizen building is today. Um, okay, and um, let's see, 
Did anything significant happen to your family? Well, you were saying um, about World War II when the when they, your dad had the dairy farm then. Yeah. I was just going to say, did anything? And maybe we don't want to get into that right now. But did anything significant happen to your family? Was there, you know, any any marking point? Was there death of a parent or fire? Anything that marked your childhood that you remember vividly, or was it pretty normal and uneventful? Uh, I'd say my family, uh, we were pretty fortunate. Everything uh, kind of rolled along day by day without any, never had a barn fire, a uh, couple of windstorms that caused some problems, but uh, no, no deaths in the family. Uh, during the Second World War, my dad had a slaughterhouse on the farm, and they closed that down. Everything had to go to the war effort. Uh, my ma and two of my sisters worked in Grand Rapids, the Globe Knitting Mills. And they basically made underwear garments for the military. And everything was rationed, but the fact that they had three people riding in one car, they got extra gas stamps to buy fuel. And also uh, stamps for tires. Everything was ration card. And we, uh, we made it through the, the war effort pretty, pretty decent. Uh, my mom was a professional uh, seamstress. My sister, she was uh, about the same. My sister ended up going down to Kalamazoo for the Globe Knitting Mill and, and instructing people down there as to how to run the machines that, I guess they called them flat lock sewing machines. They, thread, uh, I think, five or six stitches to once. And that was it for the... And did you work, were you working on a farm as a, as a, like a teenager? <coughs> did you work as a teenager then on a farm, or what did you do when you were at that stage of life? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a farm boy. I figured that was pretty important. My dad, after the First World War, he, they had a lot of mules in the First World War. And he came home and he got fascinated with mules. We had a big team of horses and I think at one time we had six mules. We had uh, one team of small mules and the other four we could use them as three, three uh, mule team hitch or pair or single. I thought that was pretty important. I had my own mule when I was about about seven years old. If I go after the cows, why I jump on that mule. And he, all I had to do was whistle. He'd run up and jump on his back and ride him down to the river to get the cows. Our farm, the south border of our farm is the Grand River. Cattle were always down along the river, so you had to, it's a half mile down, a half mile back, jump on that mule and go get the cows. Uh, when we was, my dad always raised about eight acres of potatoes, eight to ten acres, and in them days, while there wasn't any spray, you cultivated everything and take a milk can full of water out the night before and set it by a big oak tree and a bucket and a dipper. The next morning I'd go out there and you cultivate potatoes one way one day and the next day you come back and go crossways of the field to get on all four sides of the potatoes and that bucket of or that cream can full of water my dad was very insistent before you take a drink of water, you make sure that mule gets that bucket of water. It, it's 
something I never have forgotten. My kids, when we had, the kids were young, and dog, I'd tell them, before you drink water, make sure the dog's got a drink of water. It just... That's great. What would you say the most, and maybe this is it, but any other vivid memories that you have of your childhood at that time of your life? Anything else stand out in your mind that... Yeah, I, I, pretty much everything I'd done was on the farm. Uh, I wasn't allowed to go to the river because that was a dangerous puddle of water. And if you get down around the river, there's a lot of blue clay. And if I come back with blue clay on my shoes, which you couldn't hardly scrub off with a wire brush, uh, he was due for a tannin. Uh, that was a no-no. Stay away from that river. But, uh, but um, your friends from that time that you were especially close to, or what you were, anything you remember most about, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins? Did you see extended family, or did you have extended extended family around? Uh, yes. We had a pretty much extended family, but I, uh, the neighborhood, there was only two other boys in my age category, uh, farm boys, and we chummed around a little bit, and it was all farmland at that time, so yeah, if you went any places on your bicycle or you walked. So, yes, firm was uh, right on Cannonsburg Road, where the greenhouses and the farm actually were trying to get the dates and everything. It's a centennial farm. It's a hundred years with the Hoekstra family. Property where your gas farm was. That's yeah, that's it. Oh. Okay, so how many, how, how big is it? Uh, about a hundred and, well, according to the tax titles, I guess it's about 120 acres now, but it was 100 and, 130 acres, but the river takes away about six foot every year. It's moving north, and, and every year we lose about six, eight good trees along the riverbank, so. But, oh, and that river is what river? Grand River. Oh, the Grand River. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I should be more specific when I answer some questions like that. <laughs> no, no, that's, I, you said it, and I thought I uh, somehow I wasn't thinking about the Grand River being behind me there. Um, so let's talk about your your line of work. And your what, what what did you do for a living? How you know? Give me your kind of your work history. Well, uh, I had a lot of different things. I uh, I drove for a beef packer, the Ada Beef Company, for 42 years. I worked every, the kill floor, the break room, uh, beef breaking room, uh, whatever had to be done. But I ended up 42 years out on the road for him, pretty much back and forth. Detroit every day for 20 years. I uh, lived in Ada, right alongside the fire barn. Couldn't hardly live there without being on the volunteer fire department. So I was on the file, uh, Ada fire department for 18 years. Uh, my dad, when he came home from the military, uh, us kids all had to have some music in our life. And my oldest sister played accordion, my brother played guitar, my other sister was first seat on a violin at Rockford High School. The next sister was piano player. And 
I was an accordion player. And I played in a band, a dance band, for 36 years. I don't think there's a VFW, Legion Hall, dance hall, uh, reception hall within 40 miles of here that I haven't played in, some of them farther. We, uh, That's great. Oh, nice. And you, did you just do that for fun, or did you, get paid, did you get paid for it? I mean, you got gigs that were... We enjoyed it, but yes. Uh, we, we got paid for our for our band, uh, but uh, yeah, we played the Big Rapids Armory, I think, for, I know it was two years, maybe three years for New Year's Eve. Uh, played several weddings out on Beaver Island for, them were, them were a trip, them were a three-day run to get out there, play and get back home, uh, but, and they paid good for them them uh, weddings out there. Uh, yeah, most of our jobs, we had a set fee that we, but uh, as I said earlier, which story do you want to hear? Because I got many. That's great. These are, oh, this is great. I think this is all really, really great. Well, let's get back then. So you drove the truck for HB and um, for 42 years then. Tell me about the green, or was the greenhouse next or what did you do after the uh, when I was on the farm, uh, we've got about 15 acres of muck ground uh, down toward the Grand River. And my grandparents, or my grandfather, and two of my uncles raised a lot of onions and carrots, and cabbage. Uh, produce that grows exceptionally well on muck type soil. And I started a small greenhouse, just a, I think it was about 12 by 20, just to get plants to plant on the muck ground. That was part of my farming operation. Even with driving truck for the beef company. I still had cattle and still done pretty good uh, size farm operation. Uh, did you have it, help or did you, run, you didn't run that yourself while you were driving a truck or did you? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I ran that uh, pretty much. Everything was kind of organized so that you had when you got out of that truck at night I run over to the farm and take care of the cattle and it was about a two, three hours after. Most of my life, I think I slept about six hours a day. That was about, which is pretty much the same. I just, I have a hard time sleeping nights now. But uh, anyway, yeah, the, the farm operation, the greenhouses, the big greenhouses that we have there today through my smaller greenhouse, neighbors would come over and get some plants. And we finally set up a, I think that was a 30 by 50 foot greenhouse. And we were out in Hudsonville picking up some supplies. And one of the greenhouse operators out there uh, wanted to know our, where our operation was. And Hudsonville is very Dutch. And with a name like Hoekstra, we fit right in. And the next week, there was one of them greenhouse people out there looking at our operation over. And he talked us into selling some flowers. And he said he would help us supply us with some flowers to get started and get a little money flow in the spring. And it took off. Uh, and we uh, had two greenhouses on the south side of Cannonsburg Road. And we figured before somebody got run over out there on the road, parking all over, 
we move to the north side of the road, which is where the greenhouse operation is today. We still have the one on the south side, which we start everything in the wintertime in that one and move it across the road. It's all wired into the house with warnings, heat, whatever, uh, computerized. But and your, any of your family kids are going to be there? Did your wife work at the greenhouse? Or what, what was she doing when you were doing all this stuff? Uh, my wife worked at Amway for, uh, I think, 20 some years. Uh, she was in the the uh, cosmetic uh, end of it, not, rather than the soap end. But, uh, yeah, she worked the uh, second shift. And I don't know what shift you'd call mine. I went to work at one thirty in the morning, and sometimes I'd meet her. She'd be going to work, and I'd be coming home. I'd meet her on the highway and wave to her. We got along pretty good. <laughs> the only time we'd seen each other was on the weekends. And did you guys have kids? Did you have family? Or? Uh, son and one stepson. And my son and daughter-in-law are the ones that run the greenhouses today. I turned that all over to them. I take them eight, ten years ago. I just great. Um, so you mentioned that you have a Well, the the band thing oh, yeah, was the, the band thing. Uh, yeah, having played in the band, that was a lot of bought a lot of extra things that I wouldn't have had. Uh, paid for several trips to Canada, hunting and fishing, and that was all from playing in the band. Pretty much, that was extra cash. Gosh, you were a busy guy. <coughs> what about Tom? Um, were you involved in Plainfield Township at all? I know you're on the historical committee now, but did you, over the years, were you involved with the, any other community projects? Not really in Plainfield Township. When we moved back onto the farm, which was, I think, 38 years ago, uh, they wanted me to. Uh, join the Plainfield Fire Department, but I had decided that I had ate all the smoke that I wanted to. Uh, them fires are pretty tough on you. You get to a big fire and, and it's liable to be three days before you really feel healthy enough to that you can just enjoy life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, sometimes working in that situation makes you kind of forms your philosophy about life. Did it did it alter the way you think about things? You know, I mean, you know, enjoy life. You never know when it's gonna when you're gonna work. Uh, having been on the fire department, there are some definitely problems there. Uh, car accidents, fatalities is very. Very hard. <laughs> you do have family that is involved in some of that stuff. My cousin was uh, killed right at Northland Drive and Cannersburg Road. Uh, several accidents that I was on with the Ada Fire Department. Middle of the night, ice storm. Uh, you're out there, you're the first responder. And it, it's tough, that's all I got to say. Imagine, gosh. Oh, um, how did you meet your wife? How did you guys meet? Farm. 
type thing. Uh, well, a friend. Uh, she grew up in Ada Township, Two Mile Road in the Honey Creek uh, area. Her mom's and uh, stepdad's farm uh, was on Two Mile Road. They uh, owned a half a section up there, 320 acres, and they had a pretty good sized dairy operation. I think they were, I think they were milking around 50 to 60 head of cows most of the time. Uh, they farmed another, another 300 acres, I guess, uh, rented property. And they had a, quite a woods. A friend of mine was cutting logs out of the woods, and I went up there and helped him logging, and that's when I met my wife, uh, uh, was on, on the farm. So. What did you, um, tell me about the businesses. Did you go to restaurants, or where did you, where was your, where, you would go out, like do your shopping and stuff. Where did you go to, where was your business, and what kind of businesses did you go to? And, uh, when I was growing up, the Plainfield Corners down there uh, where Archer hits Plainfield, there was a grocery store there, uh, Pritchard's restaurant was there, Roy Pritchard had a Blue Sunoco gas station there, and the grocery store at one time had uh, gas. I, I, I think it was Shell. All I can remember, the pumps were yellow, and I think it was Shell gas. Uh, Saturday night, we always went to Rockford. That was uh, the uh, special for the week. Well, Get was up. It, where was it in Rockford? Well, went to the hardware store, to the dime store, and Bert Kuhn's shoe store. Bert Kuhn was a real good friend of my dad's, uh, which it was separate from the Sears store. <coughs> and us kids, if we needed money during the week for school supplies or whatever, we'd go down and borrow money from Bert Kuhn. So my dad would have to go up Saturday night and pay the pay the kids' his bills off. That's that's the way that worked in them years. It was a lot different than it is today. But uh, anything we needed, uh, uh, if we needed money, go down to Burt Coons. And he'd, I, think, I think Monk's putting shoes on most of the kids in Rockford. He probably paid for a lot of school supplies. Uh, <laughs> people would go in there on Saturday night and yeah, pay them up. <laughs> That's great. Um, how about the tornado? Do you remember the tornadoes of 56 and 65? Did they impact your farm at all? Or? Didn't, in fact, our farm. Uh, my dad, uh, I was working in the yard there, the big farmhouse across the road. And, I was raking black dirt in, and my dad came down and said, he always called them whirlwinds, and you want to see a whirlwind, we like a bunch of chickens standing out there in the yard, we didn't realize that that tornado could have swept us away, but it uh, went right up through Belmont, uh, came right up to my uncle's farm, and it was headed right for their house, and all of a sudden it just made a right turn and came over toward Rockford. Uh, so other, other than uh, blowing some trees down in his woods, it uh, missed everything there, but it, dem it demolished the west side of Rockford. <coughs> <coughs> 
Maybe I should have had a glass of water. <laughs> I got a tickle in my throat. <laughs> Are you okay? I think so. I'm always curious about when the Buddhist temple came into Belmont, what people thought it would have been here for a long time, if it was like, <laughs> That Buddhist temple, uh, where that building is, was uh, a farm there. And I, I'm not positive, but I think that's right where a man by the name of Julius Ripley had a farm there. And the only reason that I knew where his farm was, my dad, uh, Mr. Ripley, I think Carl Waters, and Art Van Seuss, uh, my dad, Uh, wanted to buy the feed mill in Belmont. And they'd done it as a co-op. And he pretty much had the biggest share of it, but uh, you had to have other people involved to call it a co-op. And they were all, well, Nart and Seuss lived right there where the town hall is today. That was his barnyard where the town hall is. And the feed mill was right across from the post office there. And my dad and the Farmers Union Co-op. So they did do it? They did run the co-op? Yeah, my dad uh, managed to get it going. The Farmers Union Co-op, the feed mill, the coal yard, and the grocery store across the street. And I think they ran that for about six, eight years. But the feed mill, uh, the dairy people were kind of feathering out. Grand Rapids was building out onto the farm ground already then, and that would have been in the late 40s, I guess, middle to eight, uh, late right after the Second World War. Yeah. So when you were growing up, that whole Belmont area was all farmland, was it? Yeah, was yeah. It? Where the, uh, where they're digging out the old golf course, uh, I picked corn on all those fields when I was in high school. My dad, uh, having worked on the farm down there by Tecumseh for that professor from Michigan State, they had all the new equipment on that farm. When he got to farming up here, he went out and bought new equipment. He was one of the first ones in the area to have a corn picker. And when I'd get out of school in the afternoon, why, I'd run down and I could pick about three or four loads of corn which were on hay racks with 12 inch plank on the side rather than the gravity beds we have today. You shoveled all the corn off them hay wagons. Uh, today on a gravity bed you open the door and it runs out but uh, it was a different but that where the golf course was that barn that is still standing there, that was Dan Booth, where the new uh, clubhouse was for the golf course, that was uh, Richard Booth. Uh, and one row corn picker and an H farm ball. <laughs> and, and I picked a lot of corn. When my dad bought that H farm ball, I drove her home from Cedar Springs. You drove yeah. the, it was like a big tractor or something, you drove it from Cedar Springs? Oh yeah, they got road gear, <laughs> they move right along. That was flying at about 18 mile an hour. <laughs> that, that, uh, I remember I pulled the yard and half the neighborhood was there. Was, I was coming home with that 
H Farm all painted up, lights and everything on it. Somebody said the uh, headlights on it, and you can just work right on through the night. My dad says, if you can't, he says, I ought to take a hammer and knock them lights right off. And he says, if you can't get it done in the daylight, quit. <laughs> You said you started the, did you start the cemetery, did you say that you, was that, or no, you said you were in the, you were in the video for the cemetery group or something? Yep. Was that, but you didn't have anything to do with starting that cemetery, that wasn't on your property? Or no, no. Yeah, okay, no. I misunderstood what you were saying. I, I remember that now. Um, let me think here. How, how, we were talking about how, you know, it used to be all farmland. What other changes have you seen in your life that either positive or negative? What what are some of the changes you've seen since you've been since you've lived here? Oh wow, that's a the uh, mobile home park there on Tannersburg Road, Leisure Village. That was a neighbor farm right there. Um, then our farm. Uh, Years ago, Joe Brewer owned an awful lot of property there. And today, when I go up there in that Oakwood Cemetery and look out across there, <coughs> excuse me, wow, I pick corn on all those fields, and that whole area there was the same level as the top of that the flat of that cemetery. That is a hard thing to believe today. Uh, from the cemetery uh, toward the light down at the bridge, that was all flat with the exceptions of probably less than, a lot less than a quarter mile. You went down the hill to the light. Uh, the Joe Brewer Mansion was up on top of that hill there in them fields. I stand up there and look today, and I, it's got to be close to 400 feet below, if not more. It always makes me wonder how many dump trucks slow to gravel did it take to get that down. <laughs> but that was all the way from Seven Mile Road to uh, the cemetery there. That was tabletop level. Wow, I didn't realize that. Well, I'm going to interview Andy Dykema. We'll have to find out. <laughs> Andy Dykema has done a lot for, for uh, changing the area. <laughs> oh, God. He's a good man, though. Don't get yeah, I know. I, I, that uh, Boulder Creek golf course. Uh, I traded Andy, I think 42 acres where the golf course is behind our greenhouses for I think it was 48 acres down along the river. And then the trade, the house that you picked me up in, I got that from Andy Dykema. And that stood toward the uh, uh, west uh, of the farm. Uh, when they rebuilt the road here about six, seven years ago, where my house stood would have been right in the middle of the road down there. We moved the house up to where it's at today. Oh, you did. Was that yeah. quite an operation? How did that go? Went pretty good. We hired a, a moving outfit. To, they loaded her on some wheels and pulled her down the road. Wow. Giant size house trailer. Um, tell me what you like most about living in this area. You know, you've been around here a long time. What What are the things that you like about living here? Believe it or not, I guess I'd have to say that rotten Grand River. <laughs> that just thing tears my fences down every spring. It's the same thing. Go down and build the fence after the flood goes down. But I still, I wouldn't know what to do if I didn't have that river down there to it's 
last night I just jumped on the tractor after I fed cattle and I went down to the river and just drove down along the river farm. Uh, I own half to three quarters of a mile of riverbank from the east side to the property to the west side. It's I never really measured it off, but I'm guessing from roads that it's got to be almost three quarters of a mile. And I guess that's that's one of my one of the highlights of it. Uh, and I always enjoy the farm operation. I still got 50 head of cattle. And if I didn't have them cattle down all along the river for pasture, the whole thing would be nothing but a brush pile. Any land, it, it, you drive through the area where cattle were on pasture in fields or hills or whatever, no cows, it grows up to brush. You, you can't hardly crawl through it. But. So do you, um, what do you do, is, are they, so you sell the meat, is that how you, what do you do with the cow? I mean, is it not? <laughs> well, as I said earlier, I worked for the Hate of Beef Company. Does that tell you where the cows went? <laughs> now, are they, I just shipped some cattle out yesterday. They went to the Whalen Livestock Auction. Uh, so, uh, but basically I have a cow-calf operation. So the cows, after about six years, it's time to replace them. And Feeder cattle are always a good, good market for them. And that's basically what I shoot for is the feeder cattle end of it. It's been great. I'm thinking, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you, I don't know if you want to look at your notes, you to, or do you, anything in, off the top of your head that you can think of that we haven't talked about? Because I think this is, we've probably got plenty of stuff, but anything else that, that you remember that might be well, I might mention that the last big farm operation we had there on the farm, we had 10,000 turkeys out there on, on range. What, no, what did you do? Did you sell those to? What, tell me about that. What was that all about? Well, the neighbor uh, was a turkey farmer, and his land was down along the Grand River and the ground was a little bit too much of a chance of it getting wet. If you had heavy rains, it didn't drain good. And, and he had some health problems with the turkeys. They would get what they called sinus problems. And, uh, and I worked for him for, I guess, four or five years. Uh, well, I worked at the Chauncey Elevator down there. <laughs> From there, I moved over to the farm with, with Ted DeWald, which the, our fences, one side was DeWald's, the other side was our fence, or our property. And him and my dad, they worked out a deal, and we ended up, on the north side of the road back where the Boulder Creek Golf Course is. We had fence all the way around that and we had 10,000 turkeys out there and that would have been in a 1951, 52 and I think into 53 yeah. What did you sell those to? What, what was that? Uh, they went out to, I can't remember the name of the plant, but it was out there by Zealand, I think. Uh, uh, why, why did you stop doing Why did they discontinue? They're not there anymore, obviously. Well, no, they, no, they, they uh, well, Teddy Wald 
was a man that was the true turkey farmer, but my dad and him worked out a deal with the and, and myself. Uh, I had a, I think I worked for $15 a week, and I can't remember how many turkeys at the end of the year that I were mine. Well, that my that was my pay. Of course, that working in that turkeys that was from about four thirty in the morning till about five six o'clock in the afternoon, and I could go do whatever I wanted, but I had to be back by dark. Uh, my dad uh, bought me a. 1949 Mercury and from the car dealer here in Rock in Rockford, uh, Sharky Whittles Motor Sales, which actually was a Plymouth Dodge dealer, but uh, 49 Mercury, a beautiful car, dual spotlights on it, and took the back seat out of it, put a mattress in there, and I slept with them turkeys for the summertime, uh, shotgun and a rifle, and, uh, in the middle of the night if something disturbs the turkeys and one of them flops off the roost and starts a stampede, they just run till they run into something that stops them. Well, if they hit the fence and they pile up, you have to get in there and separate them. And when when you get a mess like that, you just get in and start kicking and throwing. I mean, because the ones that are on the bottom are going to suffocate otherwise. you got to get them. Uh, so pretty much in the night, I make a round around. Like I say, at dual spotlights. I don't know if that's even legal today to have operational. But, uh, yeah. That was quite a quite a trip. I mean, like I say, I. <laughs> and all we do is go in, buy our buy one, right? Yeah. <laughs> we don't yeah. know what goes on behind. I tell you what, we ate a lot of turkey in them days. As them, as them turkeys get uh, in the fall, them them times they get kind of yeah feisty, and they start fighting. And if you get Two turkeys fighting. One of them's going to start showing wear and tear on him, and the other one, he's he's big shot. He just whipped that one. But now there's three more that are waiting to take on that one that just thought he was king of the roost, and he's going to go down because he tired out. And the other ones are just waiting for him. Uh, I mean, it's a terrible deal. But uh, best thing you can do is dress them out because there's nothing. They they just their fatigue and, and we had a we had a pen where we put them and but there again as soon as they got feeling better they start fighting each other so you might just as well give them to the neighbors or whatever yeah. uh, so how long did you do that how many years did you do I think I worked for for the turkey farm there for well, I guess probably about Five, six years? Yeah, six years, I guess. So. Okay. Uh, also, that was great. Well, as I said when we walked into this building, which story do you want to hear? Because I got a lot of them. I'm not a person that had one little job and went home, went to bed, went back to the job. I didn't work at General Motors or anything so like that. <laughs> spend a lot of time working. Yeah, yeah, I guess as I say, I probably ran most of my life on about six hours of sleep. Uh, but did you what did you like about driving the truck? You did that mostly. That was most your what did you enjoy about that? Uh meeting people. Uh I went down into the area Detroit, 
what they call the Eastern Market area, and it's it's a I guess it's probably about an eight ten block square right in the heart of Detroit, and about every other uh, building or shop, whichever you want to say, is either a meat plant or produce and or poultry, uh, but in the food industry, and pretty much went to the same people uh, every day. And you get so well acquainted with all the people down there that I had a little mishap down there, and people that I never even knew were glad to see me when I came back. I, somebody cut me off down there on the 96. 96 in the liver noise down in Detroit. The, the trucks that we that I drove were swinging beef. Everything you got roughly 45,000 pounds hanging in the roof. And you don't want to make any fast move sideways or steering. And one of the natives down there cut me off. Their old tornado quit. Nine, about nine o'clock in the morning, rush hour traffic, and I couldn't miss them. I caught just the back corner of that tornado, and and it jammed up my steering, and I laid a semi bottom side up in the middle of 96 down there. And Did you get hurt? Just my pride. Just my pride. And I was off, I guess, for about 10 days because I had decided I was never going to drive a truck again. I was all done. I mean, and my boss came over. He called me a couple of times. The next thing, he showed up on the porch and he said, "Well, he says, well, I know how I was feeling and this, that, and the other thing." And he says, "I got a problem." He says, "I got a load of beef sitting on a trailer. It's all set to go, and I don't have a driver." He says, "And I know you can do that." He says, "And I want you to." The last thing he said when he walked off in that porch was, I'm dependent on you. And that was a hard trip to make. That next morning was about two inches of slushy snow. And when you get off in 275, uh, back on the 96 down there in the M14, it's an elevated curve. And even on dry pavement with a load of swinging beef, it has a tendency to swerve you. And on slush and snow, I, I dreaded that from the time I left Ada till I got down there to, I think that's Novi where that interchange is. And, but I made her. And when I got back that night, he said, I knew you could do that, just, but I was afraid you was you weren't going to drive again. I said, you had that right? I said, but I said, I guess I can handle it. So I kind of figured after I'd done that, I figured I was all done. I figured they'd fire me. But no, they bought me a brand new Kentworth and sent me back out there again. So I said, well, 